haven't actually talked about your special training. No. And and why it is that that you do have some parallels with Duncan O'Finian, and um, so having having talked about the the sort of Defense Authorization Act, at least on a very surf in a sort of surface way, and and explain that that is your motivation. Um, can we actually go down that road to where we talk about where you've been and and some of the information you have because your mm -hmm. I don't know if it's your clearance level that gave you that, you know, the additional information about black projects and about uh, certain aspects of, well, to, to name Area 51 specifically, mm -hmm. uh, possibly other places that you haven't told me about yet. Do you want to go, you know, start down that road slightly? Um, sure. The level of secrecy and secret facilities and the capabilities of our nationally kept secrets um, would shatter most people's imagination of what is possible. Um, Area 51, Los Alamos, Dulce, uh, a hundred other top secret bases uh, where information is kept or hidden from the public in general, it would be very hard to accept that all of this information that is currently held secret and classified is actually real. Um, and you know this because why? Uh, because I've experienced things in the military that I've then told people about and by and large people that have never held a top secret clearance would call me either at the mildest a liar, uh, the greatest accusation, crazy. Um, certainly my experience at Area 51 and PSY training <clears throat> and what I learned there and the abilities that evolved from that training session that we all seem to pick up on rather easily um, were most easily described to the layman as Jedi skills. It's very easy, if you know what I know, to see the correlation between what happens in the movie and the Jedi training and what happens in Area 51 and Psy training. Um, certainly we, we in the Nines all possessed uh, a certain level of intuition and ability that would seem advanced to anyone who watched us use it. Can you elaborate on, on what you may have come across? Because if you're using these abilities, you're in Area 51, at what level did, level did you go down to or whatever? Uh, are you aware of off-world craft? And I mean, you know what's out there in the, in, I'm not sure how much you know about Camelot, but I, I assume that you know the general amount of information on the internet, what can you substantiate having personal sort of um, knowledge of? Um, uh, extra beyond human abilities for every human um, not subject to popular belief, but we as human beings are far more capable of using many, many advanced skills beyond five senses. Uh, with a little bit of training and the knowledge that it was actually possible, most people could accurately predict the possibilities of the future to know when other people were thinking about them. Uh, pick up on what is easy to describe as reading people, where uh, you don't really need to use your five senses to be able to know what somebody else is thinking or feeling. Um, a lot of that 
has to do simply with the belief that and the understanding that it's possible. Um, that opens up a lot of doors. Finian talks about having been enhanced uh, physically. Do you feel that you were enhanced physically? Um, no. Um, when I hear Duncan's story, um, the things that he experienced are very similar to what I experienced um, based on the fact that you were never told that the actual belief in what you were doing was giving you the ability. You were giving something, a caveat, a carrot, uh, an enhancement. Uh, they could jam a s small piece of metal in your arm and that's enough to get you believing that you have these abilities and they turn on. But one really doesn't have anything to do with the other per se. Um, I, I, I have had a device implanted in me and I later was of the understanding that that device did not do what I was told it was doing. It was not to provide enhancement, it was to provide monitoring. Mm -hmm. and but, but you're basically saying that, that it's the mental abilities that, that you it's like placebo in a sense, as long as you believe it, it's the placebo it effect, gives, yes. you, gives you that ability to do superhuman type things. Right. And that's very important because um, if you teach people these things, you want to be able to turn those things off if you want to. You want to take those abilities away from people if you don't want them to have them anymore. So, that's so if you tell them the true nature of the abilities, then you can't take belief away anymore. You have to pull the piece of metal out of the arm that says you don't have the enhancement anymore. Well, it's the Tin Man. Yes. And you know, uh, being told that that he doesn't have a heart, he needs to have a heart installed, when in fact he had a heart all along. Exactly. Or maybe that's the lion. I forget who. But but all several. Lion was the, courage. But yeah. Yeah. Several of the the, the beings in, in in that story. Uh, so, okay, well, that's, that's very valuable. So you basically were given that kind of thing. And, and I would say that... Um, and let me interject. Um, the six months where I was undergoing all the psychological treatment, um, I, I did go through a period of time where I believed all of my abilities to be gone or taken away. Um, in, 08, uh, with some help, um, I was able to transcend the barrier that kept me from using those talents. And now I've been able to refine and enhance those abilities far beyond the levels that I had in the military, which comes in handy when cops chase your cell phone GPS. <laughs> okay, absolutely. Uh, all right, so. But, but to get back to Area 51, and, and I, I understand that at this point you would be violating a security oath, oath to talk about it, right? Mm, let me put it in terms that it's easier for me to say and not have to go into the details of how I know, but just that I know. Um, <clears throat> I'll present it to everybody very simply. Um, what could be so important at Area 51 that would require the level of secrecy that is in existence around that facility. Well, certainly if I said that we kept the U.S. space fleet there and that that space fleet was what we would understand to be UFOs, even though the technology is easy to describe and easy to talk about and easy to educate people on, um, you need a lot of background in the evolution of the science that makes those things possible to be able to accept that the U.S. has dozens if not hundreds of vehicles that are more than capable of space flight and make it so we would have a fleet of vehicles that would be seemingly extraterrestrial. And the reason that that has to be kept that way is because if you know that those vehicles exist, you start to question the technology that they're based on. 
And when you start to do that, then you start to question why we're still using petroleum products and solid rocket boosters and everything else, and things get quickly out of hand after that. So to keep those vehicles a secret is to keep everything else a secret, which is why you would need that level of security to prevent anybody from finding out about it. Okay, but that space fleet, as you call it, uh, <coughs> is, ha is capable of going anywhere easily throughout the solar system without much time or hindrance to the occupants. Okay, and explain how, how fast one could get to Mars, for example. Um, just below the speed of light. Okay, but, but in an hour? Um, a day. I would a day. say it would be more reasonable. Okay. Um, incredibly fast. Okay, have you seen these vehicles yourself? Um, I've seen one type of one vehicle. Okay. And um, compared to when I saw it, which was more than 10 years ago, and what should exist now, I would say that it was a, a tinker toy bucket of parts compared to what we should have in existence now based on the evolution of the technology that I know. As far as off-world bases, I do not possess any personal knowledge. Um, I do, however, um, believe in and have seen information um, that would suggest that anybody with a decent telescope could take a look at both the surface of the moon and the surface of Mars and see some things that look very terrestrial. Sure. And things that didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. Um, <clears throat> one of the caveats that I do have some personal information uh, that I did get personally involved in um, was some information that had to do with uh, the stargates and looking glass <coughs> and more specifically the 2012 problem with those projects. Um, the, well, I guess popular opinion of what's out there right now is that the project was shut down um, because uh, there was a problem when we approached 2012. Um, I've heard it described a number of ways, uh, but to my knowledge, the problem is, is that the timelines converge on that point in time. And when you... <clears throat> know enough about the Stargate projects and the Looking Glass project to know that um, how string theory works and how the possibility of possibilities works and how making one choice over here doesn't necessarily mean that the other choice uh, couldn't exist at the same time. Um, but once you get your brain wrapped around this subject, you find out that um, at the end of 2012, uh, in an easy way to put it, uh, the choices that we make become less and less consequential to the future. And eventually, we're pushed into this bottleneck of time, uh, no matter which choice we make. And that's important to the people that had access to looking glass because they would use looking glass knowing the choices that they would make and the future would pop up. Um, the big mistake was coming up with uh, the possibility of future. And when we started using a computer to say, well, if we make this choice, it's 79% possible that this scenario happens, and 23% are 
possible or whatever, you know, using round numbers, that this scenario would happen. Um, the understanding at the time was that was realistic. However, if you go down the road further and free will continues to exercise itself on this game, um, that 79% possibility sometimes changes very, very fast. But if you look at the situation in a point of time, it seems very realistic that that's the greatest possibility. Um, what happened was people, very smart people, began to figure out that something big was coming up. Something that made it so all the possibilities of all the future scenarios of any choice, <clears throat> any possibility that was fed in and observed through the looking glass inherently ended up in the same future. And no decision, no possibility changed past a certain point. Um, that's the big secret. Okay, so is that Certainly, like 2012, in your understanding, it's it well coincides with December 21st, 2012. So at that point, all <laughs> possibilities lead to the same timelines. All possible timelines lead. lead to the same basic set of history in the future. And what is that history? To you? Did you know that, or did you find that out? That is the big question. That is the big secret. That is what sends everybody that has all of the information, that knows everything, into a blind panic. <laughs> um, the people that know everything about Looking Glass, that have gotten all the reports and all the information, the elites of the world, probably figured out that that was the end of the game. And nothing could be manipulated beyond that point. So do you think that's held true? In other words, um, well, I have about 60 questions, but do you think that's true or holding true, that nothing could be manipulated, that they haven't found a way to manipulate, that they're, that's still the case? I mean, this is knowledge that you would have gained back when? Um, back when I was in the military, it would have been before 97 when I got in trouble. Um, and it was things that uh, one of my particular areas that I was amazingly intuitive about is problem solving slash mission planning or um, more specifically taking a bad mission and fixing it, getting so, everybody through and out of it. Tro uh, troubleshooting an optimum uh, future. Exactly. Um, certainly knowing how string theory and possible futures works makes it so you can work your mind very quickly to see the reality of what's happening and decide what decisions need to be made to change it for a particular outcome. Okay, but at a certain point you said that even the powers that be, so to speak, realized that having even abilities such as yourself you're talking about, which mm -hmm. they in theory had even using a computer or a looking glass. Right, they had to use a computer to do it. Right, <clears throat> so in essence but at a certain point, it, it's still it's still an, an end game. It's still they cannot go beyond a certain point. At a certain point, after they're done hearing the computer tell them, this is what's going to happen over and over and over and over again, <coughs> um, all they become focused on is how do we fix it? Why? What is the this that's going to happen? The you know that? inevitable contraction of the timelines. The, but what does that mean for this reality? Do you know that? I don't know that. Um, what I do know is that I was called in and asked to solve this problem, this timeline contraction problem. 
and I eventually did my due diligence and did all the investigating and basically only had one piece of information and that was reinforcement. The computer's right. The timelines will contract down to some inevitable thing that you guys won't tell me about, so I can't help you. But um, it's what you're basically, you came back with was, it is inevitable. There is, it is. Uh, there, is an, there is an inevitable event. Um, it's been forecast, it's been predicted, it's been fed to us in a slot trough of what they want us to believe will happen. Um, but they don't actually However, know. comma, they don't actually have control over what happens. They only have control over the reaction, and it seems that no matter what they try to do to cause their desired reaction, it's going to have an opposite effect. Interesting. Um, now, it's much, much easier for me to explain uh, today what that process is as opposed to back then. Um, but if I had to give it a name, I would say it's the awakening process. It's an evolution of consciousness that cannot, will not, and no matter what decisions or possibilities are injected into the equation, eventually it all resolves down to us all learning the truth and becoming aware of this massive dam of lies that has been built that keep us from knowing massive volume of information that we should otherwise possess. Okay, well that's very, very uh, monumental to be told that from a pers person in your perspective um, who's had your background and your exposure. Um, is it your understanding that the notion that looking glass has been, you know, that there are various looking glasses around the, the globe, supposedly, that according to Dan Gierish were shut down, is it your understanding they're actually not shut down? Um, <clears throat> I, I believe that they're shut down um, because they are all saying the same thing and they're so it's like they're completely just, useless they're at this point, right? Um, <clears throat> it's like the Wicked Witch, you know, looking into the you know magic mirror <laughs> and always getting the same answer. Well, if you were always getting the exact opposite of the answer that you wanted, you'd stop talking to the mirror, and that's essentially what happened with Looking Glass. Is no longer. Not only did they not want people to use it anymore because they knew it was just going to burp out the same thing, uh, but at the same time they didn't want anybody else to know what it was saying. I'm sure, um, because that they would lose control because of that, that information was of a monumental concern when I was in the military about how to prevent this inevitability. Now, at first, I thought it was end of the world. Now I see end of the world as end of their world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well said. Um, okay. But are you aware, do you know the difference between looking glass and the yellow cube? Yes. Okay. And do you, are you aware of what happened to the yellow cube and how it was used? Um, and so on. Are you I, I believe that the yellow cube still exists. Um, I can't say for certain if it's on this planet, but I would say that it's definitely protected from use at this point. Okay, well that coincides with the testimony we got. Um, can you also verify that leaders of... But let me say one thing about the yellow book. Neck, or, um, and its differences um, with looking glass. Um, the yellow cube or the yellow book would give you your possible future. Yes. So it took basically the choices that you would inherently make along a timeline and tell you what that timeline would be given that you made all the choices that 
your brain would make. Well, this is exactly what I was just going to ask you. What we were told is that leaders of, of governments and so on, people in high uh, places, uh, you know, uh, politically, would, would use this to try to see their most optimum future and then follow those. those so they were using it to enhance their wealth, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. yeah. in a very egotistical way. Um, and that was part of the problem with it. Mm -hmm. And that uh, supposedly one of the specific things we're told had to do with Hillary. Are you aware of any of that? Um, you mean the 2012 protection for her? Um, well, will you tell me what you know? I don't have any firsthand knowledge of this. Um, this is all back alley information. Um, but uh, one of the last predictions that was put out by the Yellow Cube was that um, for all intents and purposes, and this is just my level of understanding, is that uh, Hillary Clinton would be president in 2012. And um, when the yellow cube is involved, it leads me to question what I know about looking glass and string theory along with that. Um, <clears throat> the first question that anybody that knew anything about the process would know is who was using the cube right. when it made that prediction. If I knew that, then I could tell you why it would predict what it predicted. Um, wasn't there also an, an issue with, um, I'm not sure, but in using the yellow cube, yellow book, however you want to term it, um, that you, they actually had to use it through um, an intuitive who had a high vibration, had to be in the vicinity to, in a sense, be the go-between between, between the, the person who wanted to use the cube right. and the cube itself, because normally they didn't have the vibration necessary. Correct. Right? And... Um, that is a process that would prevent um, anomalies from popping out in predictions. Um, but it wouldn't completely... No, and I'll tell you why. Um, if it was used properly by somebody that knew how to use it and, ha and could eliminate their thought process from the machine's effective use, it would be very easy to get an exact, you know, what future holds. Right. However, comma, anybody that has that ability would inherently know that that information could not be given and would be protected, and that inherent notion would inject something into the yellow cube or the yellow book that would would give an inaccurate statement just by the person that's using its intuition saying if I tell the truth it'll be bad so the higher levels pick up on that and throw out a different scenario Right. Isn't it's, the truth? It's in a sense the feedback loop gets dirtied somewhere along the line by exposure. And that's why those pieces of technology should have never been used by humanity in its current level of understanding. Because for all intents and purposes, the technology doesn't work right when we use it. Right. I, I, I totally get that. Okay, so to get back to Looking Glass uh, and the features that they do uh, converge, um, and the notion of, is there anything else that you can tell us, that you would want to tell us about that and the rest of the laundry list of sort of information that you had directly to either for, for yourself or through um, someone that you had vetted? Um, the biggest cherry on top of all this conversation um, would be a synopsis to say that um, 
if I could convince everybody out there that um, for all intents and purposes, what we believe to be true eventually becomes true. Um, if somebody convinces us uh, that a major disaster is going to happen in the very near future, a major disaster happens in the very near future. If we don't buy into that fear and accept that there is really nothing that we know know is going to happen and accept of whatever happens, um, that makes the convergence of the timelines happen as naturally as possible. Any attempts to try to go away from this one inevitable conclusion I again see as a new beginning, uh, an end of this reality, the beginning of something that we can't even possibly understand based on the level of our beliefs currently. But when all that information comes flooding out, there's going to be no denying what's true and what's a lie or what's illusion. Um, we won't have the choice to believe that 9-11 happened because of a bunch of terrorists because we'll know exactly what's happened. Um, basically what we're experiencing right now is <clears throat> two master chess players sitting at the board and one of them looks down at the board and sees that he's in checkmate in seven moves. And he looks across at his opponent, and he knows that his opponent sees it too. So there's no getting out of it. So at this point, the loser can only prolong the game. The game, both players know the game is over. Um, it's only a matter of time before he does this, and then you're forced to do this, and then he's forced to do this, and eventually checkmate. Um, we, as a race, if we could understand that the game is over, that based on the rules of the game, the bad guys have already lost, the good guys have already won, yes, there's moves left on the table, but those moves are being forced by the player that is going to win. Um, the only way that checkmate can't happen is if the player that's winning makes a mistake. Um, but from all of the information that I've gathered, all of the information that's been given, all of the information that's been vetted to me, it seems pretty obvious that the good guy player on the side of the chessboard knows exactly what has to be done to win the game. And so, at this point, any mistake would be all but impossible. Um, but again, you really have to understand the game to know that the guy that's losing is lost. And I'm sure most people sitting watching a chess match between two advanced chess players know the game's over long after the two players know it's over. Because they can't see the board and see that there's only seven moves left. Okay, but when we come to this convergence, and again, you've seen, or <clears throat> the looking glass has seen up to that point. Now, let me, let me say why I believe that it comes down to one inevitability is because uh, I was entrusted in, in getting it down to two possibilities. And um, I've heard both of those possibilities talked about in massive proportions, the good and the bad.
Okay, and do you want to talk, do you want to, so can you in one sentence say what the good was and the bad was, or, um, or are you able to do to, that? To most easily put it to people, I suppose. Um, one scenario is what most people would understand to be ascension, or an evolution of consciousness that brings us out of the cocoon and turns us into a butterfly. Uh, timeline two is some kind of major global catastrophe that drives most of us underground and leaves a few of us on top to fend for ourselves. Very well, very well put. Okay, so I would imagine, and, and you can... But I would also like to point it out that they call timeline two, timeline two. It seemed very odd to me that even back then it was identified as not one. And that okay. one, one, is the one didn't get one. talked about. Okay, one is the, the one that in, involves what in, in essence would be ascension or moving into, you know, from the cocoon to the butterfly. Okay. Um, but to, to, I believe, based on what you're telling me, that they would have used a lot of people like you that had a proclivity for um, being able to l see the future, mm -hmm. you know, to, to be what is a, sort of an advanced psychic remote viewer, whatever you want to call that, mm -hmm. um, and looking glass, to, to posit this, these potential futures, to go up to that point and to view it, and that you're just one of many. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you agree? I would agree. And Back in 1991, when I began my little adventure in the military, um, <clears throat> I would say that uh, it was pretty obvious that there wasn't very many of us. Um, however, comma, you go 20 years into the future, and you find out that it's coming to the point where there's a lot of people that have that ability, that are inherently realizing that ability, and are able through some unknown extraordinary means to develop that ability inside themselves without any outside help or assistance. And it's quite obvious that as far as advanced intellectual abilities as far as simple intelligence levels um, and cognitive skills of the human race has increased exponentially in the past 20 years. And people that were 10 years old in 1991 are now 30 years old and fully awake and conscious of this burning inside that says, I am a lot more than what I see in the mirror. Absolutely. Uh, okay. I do have a question in, mm -hmm. in regard to what the military industrial complex has been working on. Because with the knowledge that you say they have, Assuming that they have this level of knowledge that you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, of the timelines converging and the fact that there was going to be something. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you saw the movie or the TV show Fast Forward. I mean, but there's been so many possible, you know, scenarios in that regard. But one of the things that goes on is they are very busy building underground bases supposedly underground cities. And so they seem to be hedging their bets for the negative timeline mm -hmm. and, and putting their emphasis there. Mm -hmm. And would you say that that is because they, I mean, why would somebody want something negative to come true? Well, of course, the Illuminati have a, have a program that they're working on in that word, regard. But basically, the sort of well-meaning military that just goes after contingencies Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just working towards a future that they want to prevent or and or deal with when it comes. Can you explain why they have been hedging their bets to such a degree on the negative? Um, it's, it's very simple. Uh, they're insane. 
<laughs> and beyond insane, they have literally deluded themselves into believing that they can somehow manage to get away with what they're trying to get away with. Um, there is a distinct lack of reality in that thinking. Okay, what about the notion that CERN, for example, is engaged in trying to beat that game, as you call it? I would say, look at the problem CERN has had. The crazy little things that have kept that project from moving forward. Um, certainly they have never even come close to getting that project to the level that it, they want it to be to do what they really want to do with it. Okay, well what about the notion that, uh, that that's the party line that they haven't been able to do so? But if you really think about it, that's what they would prefer people to believe so that they don't think that there's a threat. Um, but when you uh, listen to the interviews of the scientists that are working on the project, even they say that it seems like somebody or something from the future won't let them get that project done. And the craziest little things have caused massive damage to that project. And when you get the foremost uh, thinker in string theory saying, yeah, I don't think we're going to do it because I don't think fate wants us to do it, that says something about a scientist. <laughs> and okay, so, well, thank you very much. I, I think that at this point we, we're going to have to close this down unless there's any other things that you think that we haven't covered or that, that we could possibly touch on that, that you, you want out there. Um, no, um, I don't think we'd get any further tonight. Um, certainly from what I know, the questions will come out and be more than happy to do a live feed after that and then answer any questions that anybody comes up with on this interview. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you very much, Bill Wood, for your service to humanity. Well, hopefully I can get everybody else working towards that goal as well. Absolutely. Well, apparently, regardless of which way they work, uh, the convergence will happen. Yeah, um, there's a certain element of pain that we can reduce by just not accepting that we don't have choices in the matter. And sitting back and waiting for the aliens to fix everything isn't going to help. Absolutely. If we are inevitably coming to a rise in consciousness, we should start trying to elevate our consciousness as fast as humanly possible and make that transition a lot easier when it comes.